please turn over in your songbooks to 389. And mark that, please, as a song of encouragement after our lesson this morning. 389. We'll sing the first and the last verse of that song as our song of encouragement at that time. <coughs> As with many of my lessons, I got the idea for this morning's lesson while listening to a radio segment on National Public Radio, or NPR, this past week as I was going back and forth to work. There was a time when one could listen to NPR and even watch public television and gain at least some useful knowledge in many ways. But sadly, things have changed. But as most of us know, much has changed in the world today. In fact, that word change and the idea of changes is what stuck in my mind during the week. And that which began by the NPR program I was listening to on my way to or from work this past week. I can't remember if it was in the morning or in the evening when I heard it. But you know, most of us might not be familiar with a rock singer by the name of David Bowie. But he was the subject of that radio program I was listening to, and one of his most famous songs is a song called Changes. And like so many rock stars, David Bowie, who died at the, uh, on, uh, I think he was at the age of 71, if I remember correctly, and he died on January 10th of 2016, he was not a religious man, though he claimed to be a spiritual man. If you can somehow determine the difference between that. Like so many uh, singers and so many actors and so many people of a worldly nature, though, we know that many people claim to be spiritual, even though they do not like religion in the least. When I was studying for this lesson, I come across a quote from David Bowie that shows how he felt about religion. And this quote is it goes something like this. He said, Religion is for people who fear hell. Spirituality is for people who have been there. So apparently, David Bowie thinks that since he was spiritual, he has been through hell somehow here on this earth. And religion is for people who fear the eternal hell that we read about in the Bible. And he claims that there is a great difference between the two. Well, as sad as this may sound, he probably has a much different view of religion now since he's passed away. As the Bible says, because he's gone through some changes of his own since that time, which is something similar to another rich man. And he discovered these changes or this fact when he went through the changes that occur at the time of death, according to what we read about in the rich man, about the rich man in Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. And it is sad that people wait until this time in their life to realize the differences between true religious truth and just spirituality in this life. You know, certain kinds of changes are inevitable in life, and most people cope with these changes as a natural part of life. However, all changes are not so good. And the Word of God has somewhat to say about the subject of change in the realm of true spirituality. In Job chapter 23 and verse 13, and in speaking about Almighty God, the writer says there that He is unique, and who can make Him change? And whatever His soul desires, that He does. A lot of people have tried to make God change. Even though this verse says that no one can make Him change. And a lot of people have been quite successful in convincing others that he has changed in some ways concerning his ultimate will toward man, but such is simply not the case. Another verse that we are familiar with that speaks about the subject of change is found in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, where we read these familiar words, For I am the Lord, I do not change. So from these two simple to understand verses of Old Testament scripture, we learn 
that no one can make God change because he is in command. And God has had a plan for man since the very creation of man, and concerning that plan, he will not change. Of course, that has not kept some men and women from attempting to change him and his word to fit their ways. And knowing this, we should heed the words of a very wise and inspired man who wrote, My son, fear the Lord, and the king do not associate with those given to change. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 21. And still, though many have read these same verses that we have noticed so briefly in our study thus far this morning, that has not kept them from attempting to change God's will and His ways to align more properly, in their mind at least, with their own will. But the Bible tells us as well in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In keeping with this, we are encouraged throughout the Bible to know God's ways. We learn this in Psalm 95 and verse 10. We're encouraged to know His ways. We're also encouraged in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 32 to keep His ways. And therefore, in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 40 or 14, we see that this is equal to walking in his ways. However, some in the denominational world clearly show us that they are not concerned about God's ways, they are more concerned about their ways. And this is clear enough because of the evidence that many men show in the things that they do that they care not for the ways of God because denominations serve themselves as a clear as clear evidence that those who started them were not willing to remain in the ways of God but decided to follow their own ways instead. And yet we've already seen that God has told man, neither are your ways my ways because my ways are higher than your ways. Isaiah 55 verse 9. So regardless of what good intentions many men may have had in the creation of their particular denomination, it stands as evidence of a lower way of man in the creation of denominations that try to supersede the will of God in stark contrast to the higher ways of God. Some have said that there is a semblance of truth in every denomination. And I would not argue with that. I think that a person could search and easily find some truth in every denomination that exists. However, as time continues to pass by so quickly, those semblances of truth are starting to disappear among many of the most prominent denominations even. So being true to their ecclesiastical fathers, their desire for change continues with every new generation that we see pass. For example, at one time, our friends in the Methodist Church denomination taught the truth on biblical subjects such as marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Jesus delivered to us the truth on this most debated subject in Matthew 19, verse 9, where he says so plainly, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. He goes on to say in those, that same verse there that whoever marries her who is divorced, meaning the one divorced for adultery, also commits adultery. However, this particular truth has always been difficult for some to handle. Because we see from other biblical evidence that John the baptizer actually lost his life over the subject because we read in Mark chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. 
And though this topic is clearly shown as being one that is unpopular with the world even since that time when Jesus preached it, the Methodist Church, not much more than 100 years ago, actually taught the truth on this subject. Where well, we read from their 1896 creed book these words. No divorce except for adultery shall be regarded by the church as lawful, and no minister shall solemnize marriage in any case where there is a divorced wife or husband living. But this rule shall not be applied to the innocent party to a divorce for the cause of adultery. And this we read from the doctrines and disciplines of the Methodist Church. 1896. You know, that sounds almost exactly like Christ's teaching in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. And we have more evidence that they remained with this truth on the subject for maybe close to 40 years because we read just 18 years later in the 1914 Methodist Creed book these words. Ministers shall be prohibited from solemnizing matrimony between divorced persons except innocent parties who have been divorced for the one scriptural cause. But now let us notice how they continued to have a desire for change, and change did indeed creep into their teachings. Notice what we read just about 30 or 26 years later in the 1940 Methodist Creed book. No minister shall solemnize the marriage of a divorced person whose wife or husband is living and unmarried. But this rule shall not apply to the innocent person when it is clearly established by competent testimony that the true cause for divorce was adultery or other vicious conditions which through mental or physical cruelty or physical peril invalidated the marriage vow. Did you notice that change? They had it right until they got up to the or, and that's where they added in their view on the subject. So no longer is adultery the only reason for marriage, divorce, and remarriage in the Methodist Church as of 1940. But according to the Methodist not the word of God, those who get divorces for some form of cruelty or physical peril may now get divorced and remarried. Well, now we see that the barn door was opened in the Methodist Church in 1940 on marriage, divorce, and remarriage here. And boy, did a barn, the barnyard get crowded all of a sudden when they opened this barn door. But as we go on and look at their history, we see that their need for changes is not quite over yet. Because we have the 1960s coming around, the sex, drug, and rock and roll 1960s. And so just 20 years later, we suddenly see the need to swing that barn door open a bit further. So from the 1960 Methodist Creed book, this is what we read. In view of the seriousness with which the scriptures regard divorce, a minister may solemnize the marriage of a divorced person only when he has satisfied himself by careful counseling that A, the divorced person is sufficiently aware of the factors leading to the failure of the previous marriage, B, the divorced person is sincerely preparing to make the proposed marry, marriage truly Christian, and C, sufficient time has elapsed for adequate counseling. And so you notice from these words, adultery is no longer mentioned anywhere in those verses. In fact, God's ways, his ways being divorced for adultery and remarriage of the innocent was taken completely out of the equation and replaced by all man-made ways and reasons. But you know, they're not through changing yet. For just 24 years later, we see them proudly proclaiming their ways over God's ways, as they say in the 1984 Methodist Creed book, these words where marriage partners 
even after thoughtful consideration and counsel are estranged beyond reconciliation, we recognize divorce as regrettable, but recognize the right of a divorced person to remarry. We encourage an active, accepting, and enabling commitment of the church and our society to minister to the members of divorced families. And so the rights of divorced persons to remarry are at the heart of the issue now. And you know, we don't want to start messing around with people's rights. That will get you in a lot of trouble nowadays because, you know, everybody has rights. Well, except for a few of us. Most everybody is protected by some kind of right in a political way, aren't they? Most everybody. Not everybody, but most everybody. So you don't want to go around messing with people's rights. But you know, that's a subject for another lesson, really. Human rights versus God's rights. Of course, I think that would be a rather short lesson. Because in Romans chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, we read these words. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? When are we going to learn who is the potter and who is the clay in these verses? Well, we see that our Methodist friends have still not figured it out. For their desire for change is still as strong as ever since they were first formed. And we even read about more change come 2015. Notice what kind of changes take place just a few years ago. This is what they said in 2015 in their creed books. Leadership voted to submit a legislative proposal that removes prohibitive, prohibitive language from the United Methodist Book of Discipline concerning homosexuality. The proposal would allow United Methodist pastors to perform same-sex marriages in United Methodist churches. This proposal does not consider homosexuality incompatible with Christian teachings, even though Methodists have historically recognized the practice as sinful. So there again, you see man's will being elevated above God's. And they even admit to it that it was once sinful, and yet now they've decided to be accepting of it regardless of what the Word of God says. And so you see from what I've shared with you this morning a gradual but drastic change that has resulted in the compromise with our Methodist friends on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And their compromise on that subject led them straight into compromise on gay marriage. Along these lines, this is what a Methodist preacher by the name of Ken Wilson has said. He said, I have proposed a path for these pastors that allows them to embrace people who are gay, lesbian, and transgender and to accept them fully. Welcome and wanted into the company of Jesus. I wrote a letter to my congregation when I realized my views had changed and I needed to communicate the intense theological, biblical, pastoral, and spiritual process that I had been through to get to this new place. It began with a burr beneath the saddle of my conscience. Why was I willing to let so many divorced and remarried couples know that they are welcomed and wanted while refusing the same welcome to gay and lesbian couples. You see, he's justifying his new view on the LGBT community and their right to marry based upon the fact that the Bible clearly condemns 
certain people, certain heterosexual people from marriage, divorce, and remarriage, but yet the Methodist church is allowing them to. So how can we say this to these people and not let these people do it? If we're going to flex, if we're going to change the word of God to give rights to these people, why not change it to give them to these people is basically what he's saying. He says, how could I say to the remarried couples whose second marriage was clearly condemned by the plain meaning of Scripture, you are welcome and wanting, while saying to the two mothers raising their child together, I love you, but I hate your sin. So, you see how some reason away the ways of God in order to get their way. But you know this need for change on admittedly clear biblical issues like marriage, divorce, and remarriage are not just common among our friends in the Methodist church. Their ecclesiastical cousins, the Presbyterians, are just as guilty. Let us notice as well their gradual but drastic change just for a moment on the sinful practice that we've just mentioned of homosexuality. We're going to first of all look at their minutes of the 190th General Assembly of 1978. And this is a quote. It says, United Presbyterian Church, on page, this is from a book, pages 261 and 62, Homosexuality is not God's wish for humanity. On the basis of our understanding that the practice of homosexuality is sin, we are concerned that homosexual believers and the observing world should not be left in doubt about the church's mind on this issue during any further period of study. With the exceptions of their basis of understanding being the standard for determining right and wrong in this, this that I just quoted, the statement just read is pretty well in line with the biblical teaching on the subject of homosexuality. But we see that just a couple of years later there's going to be change. It didn't take them but two years to change. They're concerned that they talked about there. You know, did you notice that part right there? We are concerned that homosexual believers and the observing world should not be left in doubt about the church's mind on this issue during any further period of study. In other words, that settles it all. It's sin. That settles it all. We don't want y'all to be concerned about it no more. That settles it. That's what they're saying in this verse, in, in, in this quote right here in 1978. Just two years later, notice what they said in their very, in the 19, 192nd General Assembly. 